but so I thank you so much for being here tonight. And there's good representation, visitors from other congregations uh, in the greater Davison area, right where the bend. So we're glad to have folks from uh, Cloud and I think Ypsilanti and Orange Creek. Creek and where else? This morning we had a couple from East Tennessee here with us. We were proud to have them this morning. Tell you about a story about a lady. A lady was uh, driving home from work one day and she had her radio on and she uh, listened to country music. She loved country music. She had it on the same station every day. And she heard a new song that came over the air and she just automatically fell in love with that song. And the title of that song was Sweet Lips and Loving Arms. Have you heard of it? No way? Never? Dustin? Sweet Lips and Loving Arms. I thought maybe you would. <laughs> you may hear it all. Have known that song. <laughs> well, she, she was so impressed with the song, she said, I've just got to get that song. I've got to find it. I've got to have that record so I can play it all the time, anytime I want to. And uh, so what she did was she called up the operator. And she asked the operator, could you help me? I heard this song on the radio. And uh, I want to find where, a place where I can buy that record. And she said, well, why don't you try Joe's Record Shop? And she just heard the lady. And she thought she said Joe's Record Shop. <laughs> and so she looked up the phone button. She got the number. She called Joe's Record Shop. And Joe answered, oh, this is Joe's Record Shop. She said, do you have sweet lips and loving arms? <laughs> he said, well, I don't know. I have a wife and eight kids. <laughs> she said, well, is that a record? He says, I don't know if it's a record, but it's certainly above average. <laughs> well, what a great crowd we have tonight. You're certainly above average for a Sunday evening crowd, because I know you could be home watching television, you know, watching uh, something on Sunday night, part three. There has to be something that you could have rather done than to be here, but I'm thankful that you're here. So God bless you for being here. What a wonderful time we're having. Had a great time this morning in our Bible class and worship hour and then the fellowship meal. And as Brother Ben has already thanked the ladies for the delicious meal, uh, I know this is going to be one of those weight gain meetings. I will probably go home 15 pounds heavier than when I came. Open your Bibles tonight to the first chapter of the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1. We're talking about not being ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many of you are here tonight and maybe perhaps you're ashamed of the gospel? Maybe you're ashamed of the Lord in some way. Maybe you're ashamed of His Word, of some part of it. Maybe you don't agree with it. Uh, maybe it opposes your life, the way that you're living, and so you really don't like it. Friends, we've got to bow ourselves, come into submission of the authority of God. And what we recognize is that the authority of the gospel the source is from God Himself. This is God's gospel. It's the gospel of God. Not only is it the gospel of Jesus Christ, verse 16, verse 1, it says it's the gospel of God. And then in verse 9, Paul says it is the gospel of His Son. But I want to tell you the story. Back in the 1800s, the late 1800s, over in England, there was a British preacher, a very prominent, well-known a uh, British preacher, he wasn't a member of the church, he was a Baptist preacher, his name was Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon became to be aware and alarmed at what was taking place in so many of the churches throughout Europe. You see, many of the preachers and the so-called churches that existed in Europe and Germany and France and England and Scotland, they were watering down the gospel. They were candy coating God's word. They were soft, soapy, the word of truth. And what was happening, it was having a terrible impact upon the churches. And really what was happening, it was Christianity in that part of the world, or, or that form of Christianity, was becoming weaker and weaker and weaker. And Charles Spurgeon was sending out the clarion call that we need to get back to the word of God. We need to preach the word of God. And I appreciate that. Uh, no matter who it is, and, and even though Charles Spurgeon had his faults, but you got to commend the attitude that wants to draw all people back to God's Word. That's what was taking place in the Restoration Movement in this country. Is denominational preachers wanted to get back to the true gospel. 
And they began to study and they began to find out that they were doing things that was not authorized in God's word. They said, we've got to change. And they came to a knowledge of the truth. And they began to preach the true gospel. We're thankful for that. There's a well-known preacher in our country today by the name of John MacArthur. I don't know what particular religion John MacArthur is, but I do commend him for the attitude that he has and what he's seeking to do because he's wanting to do the same thing that Charles Spurgeon did. Now, he may be away miles off, and I believe he is because I believe he's a Calvinistic preacher, but he wrote a book a number of years ago entitled The Shame of the Gospel, and look what the subtitle says, When the Church Becomes Like the World. He was seeing that here in this country when people were more interested in seeker-sensitive worship services or user-friendly approaches or entertainment-oriented or the emerging church movement. That seemed to be the emphasis and the focus on a great number of preachers across this land. And John MacArthur says we've got to get back to the true gospel. Now, he probably is not talking about the same true gospel that you and I believe, but the point is we need to get back to that word, to the authority of Christ. You see, the focus of so many today and the emphasis that we're hearing about is pragmatism. Whatever will fill the pew is okay. Or progressivism. That's going beyond what is written in God's word. We've got to sound out the alarm. We've got to make the clarity call clear. We don't need to be ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. I want to challenge every single one of us here tonight to rise up and to take an attitude, an unashamed stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to listen to what our Lord taught in Matthew chapter, or rather in Mark chapter 8 and verse 38. Jesus said nearly 2,000 years ago, for whoever, whosoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed uh, when he comes in the glory of his Father and the holy angels. Whoever is ashamed of me, whoever is ashamed of my words, Jesus says of that person, I will be ashamed of. Jesus is so clearly teaching us that we need to stand up for what is right. I think about the Apostle Peter as well. Peter recalled the warnings that Jesus had given. And Peter is warning those listeners, his readers, who were scattered, those scattered suffering saints. Listen to what he said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. He says, Yet if any man suffers, as a Christian, let him not be ashamed on this behalf or in this name. He said, for the time has come when the judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it begins first of all with us, he says, what shall the end be for those who have not obeyed the gospel? What shall the end be for those who do not obey the gospel? <clears throat> Well, we look to Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. And Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, I believe 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 7 through 9, he says, those who obey not the gospel, who know not God, and who obey not the gospel, shall receive that vengeance of the Lord when he comes. In flaming fire, taking vengeance upon them who know not God, and who obey not the gospel. What's the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? They're separated from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. We've got to stand up for the gospel, don't we? I think about the Apostle Paul as he wrote to that young preacher Timothy from that jail cell. And Paul challenged Timothy, you've got to stand strong and you've got to be faithful to your ministry and you can't be timid. And he says to, to Timothy, he says, Be thou uh, therefore not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor be thou, uh, but rather he said, but be thou partaker of the suffering and the afflictions of the gospel according to the, to the power of God. He says, you're going to be tried. You're going to suffer. You've got to stand up. You've got to be strong. 
I wonder today about so many in the Lord's church. Are those Christians who, who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, are they willing, truly willing, to make a stand? To stand up, to be faithful to Christ, and not be ashamed of the gospel. What a wonderful example we have the Apostle Paul. Someone right here in the New Testament, a New Testament example for us, that we as Christians today can follow, and for the reasons that Paul was not ashamed, we can imitate those in our lives. And so that's what I want us to do tonight, is to look at Romans chapter 1, and look at these verses, verses uh, 14 <coughs> through 17. And let's break this down as we look at this passage tonight. Why was Paul not ashamed of the gospel? Well, let's look what he said. First of all, he says in verse 14, he says, I am dead. Both to the barbarians and to the, or the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, so much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to them that are in Rome. I'm ready to go to Rome. I want to preach the gospel, he says. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and the salvation that everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for herein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Why was Paul unashamed of the gospel? Let me give you seven O words tonight. Number one is an obligation. Right there in verse 14, Paul says, I am obligated. I am under an obligation. I feel a tremendous weight upon me a kingly obligation to preach the gospel. Well, isn't that interesting? Well, we're going to have it everywhere, aren't we? Let's try it again. We don't want it. Get out of there. There we go. <laughs> Maybe we'll listen. Paul says, I'm better. You look at some other translations. King James says, I'm better, but in other translations, you'll find the text says, I am obligated. I feel a strong sense of obligation. I feel this great weight, this sense of duty, Paul says, to preach the gospel. Because that's what God has called me to do. God has called me to be a gospel. I mean, to preach the gospel. You remember Paul says, uh, before, he says, I was a persecutor. I was in injurious. I was... I was making havoc of the church. I was putting men and women, but God had mercy on me. And God called me to preach the gospel. So now Paul says, I've got this tremendous weight of responsibility that is mine, this obligation that I need to take the gospel to those that are lost in sin. Paul understood that pride and prejudice was one of the great causes of the Romans to have an egotistical and elitist attitude. They thought that they were the only wise ones in the world at that time. And Paul says, regardless of race and regardless of religion and regardless of relationship in the Roman society, I have a burden that is laid upon me for lost souls. I want to ask you tonight, men and women, young people, do you feel in your heart a burden, a passion, an obsession to take the gospel to those that are lost? Do we care about those that are lost? Do we feel an, a, an evangelistic debt, a responsibility that we have, just as Paul said he had, that he would not stop, he would not discontinue or cease to preach the gospel because they needed to hear the good news of the grace of God that made salvation possible. God, because of His love and His mercy, provided salvation from sin. And Paul says, I have been a, I have experienced that. I have been a recipient of God's mercy and God has shown it to me. And now I have a desire to go to Rome. How many of you have ever been to Rome? Anybody? Somebody's been to Rome. As a sightseer, on a cruise, a tour. We've been for two months with my kids. Right. They were in the Air Force. Some people ask me sometimes, have you ever been on a cruise? Have you ever been to Rome? Never been there. <clears throat> Maybe I'd like to go there someday. But you know what? If I go to Rome, it's going to be as a sightseer, right? Paul didn't go to Rome as a sightseer. He went to Rome as a soul winner. 
Paul had an obligation. He's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because of the obligation that he feels, this sense of urgency to preach the gospel to those who are at Rome. He's never been there before. There's so many places that I've never been that I want to go and see. But Paul wanted to go there to preach. He didn't plant the church at Rome, but Paul wants to go there to preach the gospel to the Christians at Rome and to those that were lost in sin, that they might hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number two, let me give you another old word, and that's the origin of the gospel. The origin of it. As we mentioned already, you look at verse 1 of, our, of chapter 1 here, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Right there, he tells us the source, the gospel's from God. It originated from God. And then in verse 9, he says, it is the gospel of the Son. And then in verse 16 in our text, he says, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's the source. It is from God. It is about Jesus. And it was given to Paul. How did he receive it? Paul says, I didn't receive it from men. I didn't get my teaching from the will of men. I got it from the will of God. God gave me. And then he would also tell us, he says, this is a revelation that was given to me by the Lord. That which I have received, I declare unto you. Paul says, this is a revelation that God has given to me through his Son, by the miraculous inspiration of the Holy Spirit. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly or completely furnished unto all good works. I want you to look over to Galatians chapter 1. If you're <coughs> In Galatians 1, Paul marvels there. He says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you to the grace of the gospel to another gospel. But then he says, there's not another gospel. There's no other gospel. But there would be some that would trouble you and who would pervert the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ. Paul says, don't listen to them. If we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If anyone preaches another gospel unto you, let him be accursed. Drop on down to verse 11. And 12 there. He says, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it. How did you get it, Paul? I got it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. The Lord has revealed this to me, that he wants me to speak to you, to preach to you. You think about the gospel for those of the Greek-speaking world, the preaching of the cross was to them what? It's foolishness, right? And to the Jews, the preaching of the cross was a stumbling block. The word for stumbling block in Greek is the word scandalon, from which we get the word scandal or scandalous. It was a scandalous thing. They thought it was a forgery of faith. How could the very Son of God, the Messiah, be crucified on a Roman cross? Unbelievable. We can't believe that. And then the Greeks, when they would hear the preaching of the cross, you talk about a king, a king who would be allowed to be crucified, who would, who would hang upon the cross. That's foolishness. But you know what it is to you and me? To those that are being saved, and that's the church, it is the power of God, isn't it? It is the power of God. We believe that gospel. We put our faith in that gospel. We trust that gospel. We obey that gospel. And we believe it's true. Paul received the truth and nothing but the truth, that heavenly truth from God that originated from the Father concerning His beloved Son, and he received it through the Holy Spirit. Therefore, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because of its origin. It comes from God. Number three, Paul was also not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because of the operation. <coughs> Look what our text says. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is what? It is the power of God and the salvation. It's the power of God.
In the Greek language, there's two basic words for power. The first one we find in the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Jesus says there, all power. The King James uses that word power. All power has been given to me, both in heaven and earth. In the Greek, it's the word excusia. And what it really means is authority. All authority of heaven and earth has been given to me. But then there's another Greek word for power, which is dunamis. That sounds familiar to you, doesn't it? Dunamis. From which we get the words like dynamic and dynamite. You remember J.J. Walker? Dynamite. It's the power of God. It's the dynamite of God. And you know how powerful dynamite can be. You take a stick of dynamite, and they can take dynamite, and they can blow away hillsides and mountainsides and, and big rocks so they can build a roadway. Well, you know what? The gospel of Jesus Christ, spiritually speaking, is more powerful than the biggest atomic bomb. Because what does it do? It blows sin right out of our lives. It sets us free from the power of sin. We, that sin has been blown away out of our lives and, and it's put us on that path that leads to heaven itself, following the way of salvation, receiving eternal life, all of that through Jesus Christ our Lord because the gospel is powerful. In Romans chapter 1 verse 4, Paul tells us that Jesus was raised with power. He's declared to be the Son of God with power, according into the resurrection from the dead. That word power that's used there is the power of God. And then to the Corinthian church, he would write, he said, For the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us is who are being saved, it is the power of God. To the Colossian church, Paul said that the powerful working of God, who hath raised him, that is Jesus, from the dead, he made us alive with him, having been buried with him in baptism, now for having forgiven you of all your trespasses. Colossians 2, verses 12 and 13. What great power we see through the gospel of Jesus Christ. The dunamis, a very powerful thing. You know the Romans would boast of their great power and ability and their energy. They controlled the world at that time, the mega power of the first century. The Roman Empire. And those emperors would use the Roman legions throughout the empire to make sure that their laws and their decrees were followed and force the laws of Rome. And here's this great power, but as powerful as Rome was militaristically, morally, ethically, and spiritually, they were weak. Rome was bankrupt morally. It was corrupt. And it was spiritually impotent. Even the Roman philosophers like Seneca called the city of Rome a cesspool of iniquity. The Roman poet Juvenal described it as a filthy sewer into which the dregs of the empire flood. There's no wonder the Apostle Paul was not ashamed of the gospel because he knew that he was bringing a host of people who were lost in their sin. Those people in Rome he was bringing them the message, that one message that really had power, that could reach down and transform their lives. It could reach down to the very recesses of their hearts and souls and transform them. Transform them by the Word of God. You've seen it happen a number of times, haven't you? Maybe even in your own life. Where would you be tonight if it wasn't for the Lord? What kind of life would you be living if you never heard the gospel? If you never obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, where would you be tonight? You know, many people might say, well, I wouldn't be here. I might be somewhere else. I might be in a bar or somewhere. I might be in a drunken stupor on, on the side of a curbside somewhere. I might be in a meth house doing drugs. But if your life has been changed, by the power of the gospel, the operation of God, 
working through His power, changing people's lives. And I know you've seen it, and you've seen people who have been transformed by the gospel. But Paul could say, look at me. I'm a great example of this. Paul could say, I'm the chief of sinners. I testify to you, Paul would say, that this is a faithful saying that's worthy of all acceptation, that Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. But he found mercy, didn't he? And Jesus changed him. Number four, Paul was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because of the outcome of the gospel. What is that power for? The operation of God, the power of God is for what? What does that lead to? It leads to salvation, doesn't it? And that word salvation and say, that's a beautiful word, isn't it? You know, the word salvation, New Testament times, among the Romans carried the basic meaning of deliverance. It was used in a variety of physical ways to describe an act that maybe a strong person has rescued someone else that was weaker from a hopeless situation. They were in peril. And now they've been delivered from that. In the pagan religious world, that word applied to the spiritual deliverance from destruction of the forces like Mother Nature. The pagan gods of the moon, the stars, and the sun have delivered us from these horrible forces. Floods and earthquakes and droughts and fires. And out in Hawaii, they're one of the islands of volcano. It's been erupted now for weeks. The Roman emperors, they were deified. They were looked at as if they were gods. They were thought to be the savior of the people because they delivered them. And they brought things to them and brought good things sometimes, but sometimes bad things. Remember Paul, how he appealed to Caesar himself? <laughs> To deliver him from the accusers who had the Jewish accusers who had accused Paul in Jerusalem, and, and Paul appeals to go to Caesar. Caesar could set him free. But when you look at the New Testament in Christianity, salvation always, always refers to the deliverance of sin. Always means the deliverance of sin. The deliverance of lost souls from the eternal damnation that's a consequence of our sins. What does sin do? Sin separates, doesn't it? It alienates us from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, your sins and your iniquities have separated from your God, you from your God. It defiles us, it destroys us, it contaminates us, it condemns us. Do you know what the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is? That powerful message is that Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Jesus saves us. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Not only does the Lord save us, but he sanctifies us and he secures us. Our salvation, our souls. Aren't you thankful for the gospel? That that gospel has the power unto salvation. To set us free from the power of sin. I want you to look over the book of Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And I want us to read several verses of scripture here. Begin at verse 7 of Romans 6. For he that is dead is free from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, and death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead, indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from, 
from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Skip over to verse 16. There he says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Then, when? Right then. When you obeyed that form of doctrine, you have been set free from sin. What's the form of doctrine that was delivered to them? Turn back to verse 3. Listen to what Paul says here in verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also we should walk in newness of life. We have been set free from sin, delivered from sin by the power of the gospel because Jesus saves us. Paul could say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God and the salvation. But look at the outreach. The outreach of the gospel. Who's it for? Who's it for? It's to everyone. To every single person. That's you and me and our neighbors and our friends and our loved ones and family members and co-workers and all the people here in Davidson, Michigan and Flint, Michigan and Genesee County and the state of Michigan and throughout the whole entire world. It's for everyone. No exception. Anyone that would come to Christ Whosoever will, let him come. Let him drink of the water of life freely. Not just 144,000, not just a selective few, but all who will come. The gospel is for all, isn't it? For one, the Lord has made the race through. One has come to fall. Where sin has gone, must go his grace. The gospel is for all. It's for everyone who will hear it. Everyone who will accept it and everyone who who will believe it? The scope of the gospel is worldwide. Why is that? It's because all have sinned, haven't they? Every single person has committed sin, sin against God. And their sins have separated them from Him. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. Every single person needs a Savior. Every single person needs to hear the gospel to receive that salvation. That's an exclusive message. And it reaches out to everyone because we need a Savior. Sometimes when I study with individuals, Brother Ben and Brother Travis, I'll take a sheet of paper and I'll draw three uh, circles, each one within the other. And, and, and I say that these three circles represents basically three types of people. The inner middle circle and center circle is those that are safe. That's young children who haven't reached the age of accountability. They're safe in the arms of Jesus. They haven't committed sin. They don't know what sin is. The outside that circle becomes the second group of people. That's when you reach the age of accountability and you transgress God's law. For sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, verse 4. When you sin, you transgress the law of God, and therefore you become lost. And you don't want to stay in that place. You don't want to stay in that condition. So the third circle is for those who have obeyed the gospel. And they're saved. They're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus' blood does, isn't it? It saves people from their sins. Jesus is the Savior of the body. And those who are saved, He adds them to the body, right? Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church, which is what? His body. Acts 2, 47. Ephesians 1, 22, 23. Colossians 1, 18. He's the head over the church, which is His body. The fullness of Him that filleth all in all. And He takes those saved people and He places them where? Places them in his body, which is the church. 
the church is made up of only the saved. There are no unsaved people in the church. There are no unsaved Christians, no unbaptized Christians in the New Testament. Every single person in the New Testament who became a Christian was baptized in Jesus Christ to receive the salvation, the forgiveness of their sins. Remember what I said this morning? God's not in the dry cleaning business. He put water in the plant, didn't he? John was baptized in near Antioch because there was much water there. John 3, 23. In Acts chapter 8, Philip and the eunuch, they saw, the eunuch saw the water, says, here, see, here's water. What did hinder me be baptized? They both went down into the water. There's a going down into the water, and there's also a coming up out of the water. Philip baptized the eunuch in that water. They both came up out of it. And the Spirit of the Lord called Philip away, and the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. Why? Because his sins had been washed away. You remember what Ananias told Saul, Acts chapter 16? He said, Saul, Saul, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Call upon the name of the Lord. Or Acts 22, verse 16. Be baptized into Jesus Christ. Why? Because that's where you contact the blood. Jesus remembered he shed his blood and his death. John chapter 19. That Roman soldier took that spear and pierced his side and forthwith came out blood and water. God put both into his plan of salvation. You see, because it's in the waters of baptism that you contact the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses you from your sins. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God and the salvation. To who? To everyone. To everyone. You know, this plan goes back, the promise all the way back to Abraham, doesn't it? In Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, God promised Abraham that through his seed all the families of the earth would be blessed. That's why the gospel was to be preached first of all to the Jew, then to the Greek, because that was part of God's plan. Here was a people who should have been the most receptive. Here was a people, a people who were ready. They were reachable. They were the descendants of Abraham through whom the promise was made. It was the right time. The time had come. Galatians 4 verse 4 says, In the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the curse of the law. Now you have responsibility. Here, these people are part of that promise. Remember what Peter said to those people on the day of Pentecost? For this promise is unto you and to your children, and as many as are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. They were part of that promise. They had a responsibility. When Jesus was preaching, he first went to where? The lost house of Israel. And he taught his disciples to do the same. But then after his death, the Great Commission, he sent them into all the world to preach the gospel to every single person. Those Jews had a responsibility, and they should have been right receptive. In our way of thinking, they should have been the most receptive people of all because they had those oracles of God all the way back to the time of Moses that had prophesied and foretold about Christ. But when Jesus comes, He came unto His own and His own received Him not. But as many as did receive Him, to them He gave the power to be called the sons of God. But when those Jewish people rejected Jesus, what does God do to Paul? He makes him an apostle to the Gentiles. God sends him to the Gentiles because the gospel is for all. But not only do we have the origin, the source, the object, or we want to talk about the object now. What is the object of the gospel is to reveal something. What does it reveal to us? Over 60 times in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul uses the word righteousness or some form of it. Over 60 times. You see, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith. Paul quotes from that Old Testament prophet Habakkuk, Habakkuk 2.44. We find that statement used again in the book of Galatians 1 and verse 11. And then in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38. The just shall live by faith because that's where righteous people live. 
Those who have received the righteousness of God, not of their own doing, not because they're morally good or morally pure or could save themselves, they cannot. It's the working of God. You see, we're saved by grace, aren't we? Through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But we receive the righteousness, or we're declared to be righteous. Why? Because we believe in Christ. Because we've said, accepted Him to be our Savior. God takes a people who were lost humanity. And because of the goodness and the holiness of God and His mercy and His grace, God declares us to be righteous based upon our faith. We are declared to be righteous. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God took Him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God done anything to save ourselves, we couldn't do it if we wanted to. We're not purely morally good enough to save ourselves. It's through the vicarious suffering of our Lord. Jesus died for us and for our sin and He purchased our salvation and He's delivered us from sin and He set us free from the power of sin. And therefore Paul can say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God and the salvation and it reveals that our God is a righteous God. And God takes us based upon what Jesus has done for us at the cross and He makes us just as if we never sinned. We're justified through the blood of Jesus Christ. But then lastly tonight, may I share with you this final old word and that's the obedience to the gospel. Why is Paul not ashamed of the gospel? Because where it leads, that faith leads to salvation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, he said, for it's the power of God and the salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for herein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. We live by faith, don't we? Faith has an important part in our lives as Christians. Faith is one of the bases by which we're saved. Through grace, or by grace through faith. But you notice it doesn't say by faith only. It doesn't say by faith alone. The only time that you ever find those two words together, faith only, is in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 26, where James says, Seeing then that you're justified, not, may I repeat that, not by faith only. Not by faith only. Not by faith only, but by grace through faith. That none of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works which we have done, not of our own righteousness, but through the righteousness of God. And we receive that obedience of faith. That's what Paul is directing these people to understand. You look at the book of Romans, and I call, I refer to it as the bookends. That this book begins and ends with the same familiar statement. You find it first of all in Romans chapter 1 and verse 5. And then you find it at the end of chapter 16 verse 26. And it's the obedience of faith. Let's look at the first one, Romans 1 and verse 5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for, for what Paul? For obedience of faith. To lead people to the obedience of faith. And you turn over the, the last chapter of the book of Romans, chapter 16. And I want you to read a couple verses there with me. Begin at verse 24. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the lasting God, or the everlasting God, the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all the nations. For what purpose? For the obedience of faith. Faith leads to obedience, doesn't it? Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, For though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, 
He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Oh yes, you've got to believe with your heart. You've got to accept Jesus with your heart. But the Bible tells us that the heart is the mind. The Christian heart is the mind. We have that mental capacity to understand. We read and we study and we understand who Jesus is and, and what He's done for us. And then we accept that plan that God has provided for us. And not only do we just accept it in our mind as well as in our heart. You see, because Christianity is not just a head religion. It's also a heart religion. We believe in our heart. That God hath raised Him from the dead and He shall be saved. But it also affects the will. And the will of man makes that decision based upon what he understands and based upon what he believes. And that he believes in his heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. And what are you going to do about that information? What are you going to do about that fact that Christ is Lord? Will you confess him? Will you bow your knee to him? You see, you're going to one day. Every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. If you don't do it in this life to salvation, you'll do it in the next, in the condemnation. But the obedience of faith. Oh, what a wonderful thing that Paul could talk about. The faith of the gospel leads us to be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it receives the blessing and the privileges and the promises that God has provided for us. And therefore, Paul can make that statement. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that obeyed or that believeth. To the Jew first, also to the Greek. For here it is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. As we close tonight, I like to go to movies, don't you? We don't go to very many, but when we do, I like to, I like to watch a good movie. The movies I like to watch are usually action movies. A lot of them are war movies. Got a lot of fighting, bloodshed. I kind of like that. Tammy's not so keen on it. You know, she likes the love story. That's how women are, right? But I like those power action movies. We went to see Hacksaw Ridge. It's a story, it's a true story, about a young man in World War II who was a conscientious objector. He was a member of the Seventh-day Adventists. He didn't believe in killing, but he did believe in helping and served his country. He wanted to serve, and so he enlisted during World War II, and he wanted to be a paramedic, and they made it. They wanted him to carry a gun, and he refused, and they punished him severely for it. They ridiculed him. They put him through so many trials. But eventually he was approved. He could serve in the U.S. Army as a medic and not carry a gun. On the island of Okinawa. Had high and massive hills and cliffs. And the GI soldiers had to climb up this rope ladder to the top of this ridge. And this ridge was called Hacksaw Ridge. And the U.S. forces, those soldiers, those GIs in World War II, climbed that rope ladder and got on top. And as soon as they got on top, they were bombarded by enemy fire. The Japanese brought down a hail of bullets upon those soldiers and bombs and mortars. And right and left, U.S. soldiers were dropping dead or wounded. And it was the job of Desmond Doss to go out there and retrieve them and rescue them and to tend to their wounds and try to save them if he could. Finally, nightfall came. And there were a lot of soldiers up on top of Hacksaw Ridge that were wounded. And the only one that had the strength to do anything about it, to help anyone at all, was Desmond Doss. And he went crawling through the, through the mud and the muck and the blood and over dead bodies and sometimes even hiding under dead bodies to avoid the Japanese soldiers. And one by one, he would carry those soldiers to the cliff and he would tie a rope around them and with that rope in his hands he would lower them down that cliff, the face of that cliff, all night long. And the only thing that kept him going was the prayer that he kept saying to himself over and over again, Lord, help me get just one more 
Help me get just one more. In that statement, I thought there's a good sermon right there. Our prayer tonight is, and I believe the Lord will join with us in that prayer, is give me one more. Jesus wants one more soul to be added to his kingdom. There may be someone here tonight, and I don't know your heart, and you may be 15 years old, you may be 60 years old, or 95. But if you've never obeyed the gospel, then you're lost on sight of Jesus Christ. And the only way that you can be saved is to be baptized into his blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Why do you wait? Why do you linger? Why do you put it off and hesitate? If you're on the devil's side tonight because you're not a Christian, isn't it time you join the ranks of the faithful? Isn't it time that you switched sides and became a child of God? A New Testament Christian washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. He'll set you free. He'll add you to his body, which is the saved. And he'll give you life eternal. Why not come to him tonight? March the 4th, I baptized a 70-year-old woman named Clara Martin. Clara was raised in the church as a girl. She grew up. But she never obeyed the gospel. When she got to became an adult, she left the church, and for 60 years, she was away from the Lord. And then she finally realized, I need to get my life right with God. She said, I didn't make the decision a long time ago when I should have when I was younger. All those years I wasted when I could have been given my life in service to Christ. But she said, I'm ready, and I need to make it right now. We baptized Clara into Jesus Christ for the remission of her sins. And when she came up out of that water, she grabbed me and got me soaking wet from head to toe. And this is what she said. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Tonight, we'll say thank you, Jesus, when you're washed in the blood of the Lamb. If you need to come, will you do it? Walk together and stand and sing.